everybody, this is Phil Town. And this is Danielle Town. And here we are for the Invested Podcast. Welcome. And it is, oh yeah, welcome. <laughs> and we are, uh, we we're kind of talking about international businesses last time. God, that is makes it, us a, sound so sophisticated. It's a problem. I mean, first off, it's, <laughs> it's the, the only problem of investing in great big companies is if you happen to think that they suppress competition, they destroy small companies as a matter of course, mm-hmm. that they become more powerful than governments mm-hmm. or as powerful. I mean, if, uh, if those uh, those few little things bother you, then there's an issue here. It's the laundry list of things people worry about when it comes to huge companies and which as investors we kind of like want to have happen question mark because we're supporting these companies question mark i think that's the really tough push and pull of investing in large public companies do you really want it to grow bigger i don't know yeah i mean it's here's the thing I'm, i'm a bit of a jeffersonian Democrat, if if you will, I I really like the original vision of America, as we're all living on a small farm milking our cow. I think that's that's a good vision, but it is long gone, of course, right? I mean, at one point, at one point, that was that made a lot of of sense because it well, it still makes a lot of sense because in that environment, you're seeing families that are closer together, children are raised in in the proximity of the home, they learn to work. They they go, they're influenced by the small town that they live in. So you can't. You're just not anonymous. You just don't wander around without any any, any handrails. You know, it's just yeah. I think you don't get to just do whatever you want. Mayberry TV version of that kind of life. Yeah. That at and it's not far off, honestly. Um, but the the not Mayberry version is our great grandfather or your great great grandfather really slaving away at a dangerous job in Iceland Mm -hmm. and then, you know, saying this is, it would be way better to risk our lives to go to America and just start over than to be here um, shark fishing for a living. And and they end up homesteading in North Dakota in the 1800s. I I don't know that that was an entirely safe process either. But at, at the end of the day, you know, they were successful, they raised a successful family, the, the family continued to prosper, and here we are, right? Mm-hmm. And we're a long way from that family farm, a long, 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 long way from that family farm. And and that's kind of the evolution of most, probably most people. Uh, have, that's the idea, that's the dream. Right, that's the dream. We don't Capital work D. nearly as hard. And all of that means that the idea of small goes away. And, and you have to deal with big. And still, it's just like there's all kinds of problems with big. And we're seeing them in the world today. I mean, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think Apple Computer built the iPhone in order to destroy children's brains. And I don't think Facebook was developed in order to destroy the, the minds of an entire generation. Oh, uh, no. Facebook no. was developed to find girls. Yeah. It was like a relationship building thing it, yeah. from lonely boys, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and and now probably I was in, starting. I can say that because I was in college in Boston at the time that Facebook was invented, and it was very much like now I can know who's around me. Now I can know who's in my class. Now I can know who's at other colleges because I was at a women's college. So it was like, oh, now I can find out what boys there are. <laughs> yeah, well sort of solving the problem that got created when you left the small town where you knew who the boys were because they were sitting in church with you. And, yeah. And, and you're right? like, but get me out of here. Yeah, there are only seven of them. Yeah, exactly. They're all <laughs> your, your cousin once removed. <laughs> <laughs> right? So it looks really good. Oh, we go to the big city. We go to the big college. We have all this. We don't know anybody. and You can't get to know anybody. And I remember, do you remember the uh, apartment in New York that I had? That yeah. you went to school living in. You yeah. went to law school in there. In law school, yeah. Right? Did you ever meet a neighbor? Oh, yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah. Bo- people have, several? People have, out, people have never lived in New York. 
I feel like you kind of lived in New York, so maybe I you never the experience. saw. I don't know. I never saw a single person. Well, obviously, you have to complex. have the serendipity of walking out of your apartment or into your apartment at the exact same time, which you know doesn't right. happen that often when there's six apartments on the floor. But, right. Um, but I did, and I think like New York and big cities have a very strong form of community that I think people who don't live in cities can't relate to. It's a, it's sort of a, like, we don't have to be friends. We don't have to be buddy, buddy. Like it's great if we are, that's bonus, but we are each other's team. Like if there's a problem, we are this apartment building and we need to make sure like we all know what's going on because it's all shared space. Really? So, yeah, yeah. That's what like condo board meetings are for and stuff. Well, I had that, I had apartment for years and I didn't. But you rented any of that. it. You didn't own it. Well, no, I didn't own it. Is, is that the difference? If you're an owner, it's another story, probably. No, I think I probably could have gone to those meetings. I just didn't. Um. So no, there's definitely like a strong community in cities. It's just different than in a small town, and and having lived in both. Very, very small towns, literally next to a farm with pigs and cows. And very, very big city, New York Listen, City, I, in I'd Union I put you Square. there. I should know about that. I know, but like, think of that dichotomy between the two of the, those. Are, that's pretty much as far as part as you get when talking about, you know, city versus country. Um, and I... I feel like we knew, I mean, we definitely knew our neighbors in Iowa, but I didn't, as a kid, right? So maybe maybe I'm wrong about this. I didn't feel the same sense of, like, connection or community with the people who live near us because they kind of, like, had their own house and they were, like, over there. Whereas in close quarters, you have to deal with each other and support each other so like here in Zurich we've gotten to know our neighbors in our building pretty well and have now like some good friends here and it's really nice well I think that happens in rural communities too I mean we live on a on a farm and uh, our neighbors mostly live on farms but we know each other from a shared commonality with horses and yeah and hounds and all that so you know we have developed social relationships yeah, and the uh, difference been, is that nobody's out there going like people on farms don't make friends with other people on farms, but right? people do go people in cities don't make friends with their neighbors. <laughs> I guess I don't know. You I'm know, sure some people do. Lots of people do because they don't want to. I imagine it's kind of the same. I mean, if you develop uh, 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 some things that you enjoy doing in a city, you might find some people having it in common with you and start yeah. to build a friendship. New and Yorkers maybe you, are some of the know. nicest, most helpful people ever like that place like think of when the blackout happened that place came together think of when 9-11 happened that place came together and there is a yeah, there I... is a really strong feeling of in a serious situation we have to help each other out and it doesn't always happen there were riots in the 70s that didn't go that way but i think you know since i've been around it's been like that well, I think, you know, it's inevitable, I guess, that, I mean, we can't, we, we're not going to turn back the time to small farms in America, you know, and, and so I guess we have to get used to the idea that it's a different world, and that world has businesses that are very successful and grow, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and of course, as investors, we want to invest in them, but I, I do feel like there's a, ah, there's a, there's, a, there's something about large businesses that is that is so i don't know oppressive yes. like I, I feel that about seeing a mcdonald's at every corner along with a burger king along with a chick-fil-a yeah um you know oh i know that walmart is responsible for putting i mean small towns in the south have gone out of business due to the impact of big box stores Coming in and destroying the pharmacy, the dentist, you know. Right. Like first, you wreck the pharmacy, the grocery store, the clothing store, and and then your, your dentist is gone because there's nobody there to support him. And 
and these small towns are boarded up and it's because almost entirely yeah. because a Walmart showed up. And so here's the salient question. An event happens to Walmart, their stock price goes down for whatever reason, you person X thinks Walmart is going to totally recover from this event. Mm -hmm. Is that that I think the next question is, is this the kind of company I want to support? Yeah. And, but and, it's and hard what are the, because if you are very convinced that the price is really good and it's going to go back up and you decide not to invest in Walmart because you don't like it, you've left money on the table. And that requires yeah. a lot of strong convictions. Well, our teachers have always left money on the table. Yeah. You know, there there's a set of companies that Buffett and Munger would never invest in just based on exactly what we're talking about, your, your choice as a person about what you want to support. <clears throat> so I guess one of the criteria that we have to look at is whether you want to support a company that's going to grow into this international company or already is, has already grown into this gigantic international company and is dominating the world. Yeah, exactly. All right, here's, here's a couple of examples. Amazon, which probably all of us just from financial perspective would have loved to figure out in about 1998 <laughs> and own it. Um, they'd lose money on their retail side and they make it up on their cloud business, right? And, and they use the power of that profit to destroy competitors, okay? So they've done that, that since the beginning. Yeah, is that what you wanna do? That was is their, that, that that was their business model. Like if like figuring out in 1999 was figuring out that that was their business sure, model. Sure. Right. I, I get it. I mean, I, I just I just. OK, you take a look at the companies that are killing it out there right now. The Googles, Facebooks, uh, Amazon, Apple, <clears throat> all these companies are huge. They're the really good side of being an international business, obviously, is it links us all together around the world. Um, that's that's probably a really good thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea is that if you're in business together, you're not going to have a war. Uh, Access, and there's probably a lot of truth economic to that. connections. Yeah, basically, what is underlying the idea of the the EU having a common market, preventing people wanting to kill other people in the common market? Yeah, and it's it's actually effective. I think. Yeah, uh, it works yeah. pretty well. And you think about China trying to make its make its place in the world. Uh, militarily and you kind of wonder how much more aggressive they would be if they didn't have to sell all this stuff to the west mm -hmm. right i mean maybe maybe that's putting a, a, a the breakers on in some kind of a way and then again you see that getting interlinked deeply can create enormous problems if you start to have an enemy mm -hmm. or is, a disruption like in the disruption. pandemic we saw how dependent non-Chinese companies were on Chinese manufacturing, shipping, yeah, access, everything. Yeah. So I guess, you know, and you think about buying into a company that's maybe it's a billion dollar market cap when you buy into it, which is a small cap. I mean, effectively, what you're hoping is this thing will grow. Let's say let's say it's growing at a really clip, clippy rate, like 15 percent a year. Effectively, you're saying, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this company doubling in size and influence in five years. Yeah. And in yeah, 10 absolutely. years, with, yeah. within my within my, you know, my time frame that I'm seeing this, I think it could be four times larger in 10 years at this 15 percent growth rate, four times larger. So it would go to a two billion, then to a four billion dollar company yeah. in that 10 year period. That'd be a great investment for me. And then you look and say, OK, well, what does that mean in terms of the world? What What is having this company be four billion dollars of market cap mean in terms of how this is impacting the environment and you've got to be good with that i think, I think you gotta be okay like with cool, that we've never said it exactly like that and i really like hearing you say that because we we talk a lot about like they'll let's say quadruple they'll quadruple their market cap they'll let's say they'll they're called they'll double their free cash flow whatever like all of this comes all these numbers come from the company growing unless they manage to stay tiny and somehow increase profit and sales but uh, that seems unlikely so it's 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 this company x 
putting its tentacles out and expanding. And do I want that? Well, yeah. I mean, we want that. But then well, do we want that in the world? So then we I want that as an investor. But do yeah, we yeah, want yeah. that thing in the world to be yeah, continuing that's what I to mean. grow? Exactly. So let's take let's take an example of something like let's say Chick uh, not Chick fil A, but let's say uh, Chipotle Mexican Grill. Okay, that's one we've pounded on for years. <laughs> so Chipotle Mexican Grill has been growing at eighteen percent a year or more for a long, long time, like almost twenty years of that. And 18% a year will double you every four years, which means mm -hmm. they start off over here, let's say, at 100 million when they go public, and they double every four years for 20 years. That's five doubles, right? So you go from 100 million to 200 million, 400 million, 800 million, 1.6 billion, 3.2 billion, and they've actually grown much, 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 much faster than that. So you have to look at that and say, okay, is the world a better place because these guys have 2,000 stores instead of two stores? Is yeah. it a better place? Yeah. And and I I think in that case, I could say, yeah, I, I feel like that's a good product. It's good for the world. You know, it's a it's a high quality food. I could I can think it's a better place for that. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm, okay, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's take another one. Um, that's growing really, really well that we've bought into Sprouts Farmer's Market. Another another one like, okay, these guys are growing at, right now they're growing, they, they've just gone from $22 to $100 a share in the last two wow, years. Wow, go Sprouts. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, they exploded. It's like finally the market See, looked at look them at and that. went, oh. There, my reaction, yay, Sprouts is so much bigger than it used to be. That puts a smile on my face. So... I want sprouts to grow, apparently. Yeah. You like to see sprouts in the world, more sprouts stores. More sprout stores. Sure. And I look at that and go, okay, what are they doing? They're well, they're they're uh, doing natural and a lot of organic food. They do it like a farmer's market. It's like you walk in there every day and it's something new. And they're buying it at really low prices from the farmers, excess mm -hmm. produce, mm -hmm. and then put it in their stores super cheap. And, and by they the can way, compete. along the way, trying to support local farmers. Oh, super supporting it's, local farmers. It's That's really a whole cool. game plan. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool like that. So we go, okay, we like that. Yeah, that that would be awesome mm -hmm. to, to grow around the world. Okay, good. So I think each company we want to look at. Okay, let's, let's take another one. Netflix. Netflix, we bought into it 200. It's now at almost 700 a couple mm. years later. And Netflix, do we want to see Netflix dominate all of streaming? Which is it already is. It was dominating when we bought in. The question is, will it continue to dominate? Will it continue to produce uh, shows that people want to see? And we have, I guess, for me, I, I got to look at what they produce. You know, what are they trying to do? And what I see them trying to do that I really like is they are not trying to be politically correct about anything. They are trying to deliver shows that people want to see, not the shows that they think they should see. And I think that's a good thing compared to what Hollywood has been spitting out, uh, you know, using using a certain set of moral a moral view of the world. And then you turn out movies that are, are like that, okay? Which I'm fine with. I don't have to watch them. Yeah, I'm but I like it. confused by the complaint, but okay. Well, I'm just thinking Netflix is more like... Uh, I mean, feel free to like watch you, all the... You know, murder six episode arcs you want. Well, yeah. I mean, if that's what you want, they're yeah. going to know it, and if there are enough people want it, they're going to deliver it. I mean, and I need another gonna... season of Selling Sunset, and the most recent one just came out like two weeks ago. So you know, get on it, guys. <laughs> Live your life a little faster. I need my content. Yeah. So, I I. And I think that Netflix is something you can choose to watch. It's not going to produce an algorithm that sticks you on it the way TikTok does. I mean, they, they have become, <laughs> they've gotten so good at it that, that it's hard to put it down. It really is. They're just extremely good at delivering something that's sticky yeah. for you to okay, watch. Okay, so there's a good example of one that I would not buy and do not want to be bigger. Because I think the siloization of our inter of our information is extremely dangerous, and the more yeah, that, that there are 
apps where their entire goal is to get you to see stuff that you like, mm -hmm. it's going to make us into the people from Idiocracy who know nothing. Yeah. Not yeah. to mention <laughs> all the little bits and bobs and cookies that are in that app and on the website and everything. So Hey, get get this. They're just I won't out even have research. it on my phone. I know I'm like an oldie. I, I just won't even have it. I won't let it. I, well, I this is how pernicious no it, it is. They just did some research to find that um, they asked people if they, let's see, what did they say? There, was, there were a couple things they asked them about um, where basically people were like, yeah, I do this and I, you know, I, and I'm really glad it exists. <clears throat> right? These are things people support. And then they went to, to TikTok and they said, you know, are you doing several hours? Or how much time do you spend on TikTok or, how, or do you use TikTok? Hands go up. And how many of you wish you'd never seen it, wish it had never been built? And all the hands go up. What? There's an entire generation that's addicted to this social media stuff and knows it and wants out but can't opt out. That's like a... That's what heroin addicts are like, right? Heroin addicts wish heroin had never been invented, but they can't stop taking it. And that's what this casual research is. There's, there's a guy named Jonathan Haidt who's writing about this, uh, mm -hmm. NYU. NYU Stern Business School professor, by the way, um, who's doing this in his classes and just finding that there is this there are now apps out there that control your mind to a certain degree. They, they release dopamine yeah. in such a way that you're just kind of locked into it the way yeah. you would be into a drug. The reason it works is it's hilarious. It's fun. And, like, and you get fun. And, it's and you want some more fun. Zero effort. That's right? why it's enjoyable. Right? Yeah. Right? Like, it's, right, not, so it's maybe, not like they're out there being like, we're going to feed you terrible stuff. It's like... Hello, yeah. this is genuinely fantastic entertainment. <laughs> right? So then, then we maybe don't want to buy into a company like that. For me, I, I would have trouble with that. But I own Google. Now now we come to some really difficult stuff. These yeah. guys dominate their world. They do a lot of other things. They're building a lot of other things, much of which is unsuccessful. Um, they obviously are having a cloud based, you know, company as well. That's very mm -hmm. successful. And, and really kind of the question is, do I want to, do I want Google in the world? Do I want to see Google in the world? Right. Wait, and I think, do you want to see Google in the world period? Or do you want to see it bigger? Yeah. Do I want to see it bigger? Do I want to see it bigger in the world, more dominant than it already is. And that is, um, uh, can I okay, say so why I think that's a question that sound, that feels difficult? Yeah. I think it's because the services that they provide are so pervasive that just as an instinctual reaction, I think we generally are like, no, Google's, they're good. Like, we don't really want them to be more powerful mm. with all the stuff that they've got. But to say that you don't want Google to be bigger means that you don't want Google to invent something new, amazing, unheard of before. And that is something we want, just as a people. Like, like we want people who are out there who are being paid to come up with cool stuff that's going to make lives better and easier. And... Google pays people to do that to some extent. Now you're so, on it because because I think you have to ask, is Google the right vehicle? Is a big company like Google the right vehicle sure. and maybe for inventing not. new yeah. stuff? Yeah, but the fact is that they do. Well, they sort of do. And what they also do is they crush companies that are trying to invent new stuff. Well, I mean, anybody that's trying to invent anything new in search is going to get crushed. Um I mean, the fact that yeah. Google is now on the back foot with regard to AI is sort of amazing. It was some Google engineers that left, got money from Elon Musk, and started OpenAI and leapfrogged everyone in the AI world. Uh, I mean, a classic view of big is not better is IBM that was trying to work on AI for 20 years, easy. 
Yeah, great um, point. And never did anything remotely useful. Mm -hmm. And finally just has succumbed now to the AI revolution and is sitting there looking at the expense of billions of dollars and, and dozens of years absolutely wasted. I mean, there is a decent argument to be made in a uh, sort of term paper style that there have been evolutionary epochs of companies, <laughs> such as like the IBM early computer era and the telephonic AT&T era, where there were these huge companies that felt like they controlled our communication and they were never going to go anywhere. And then they did to the point where, like, it's not even a thing because we have now a completely other, unrelated almost. When you um, said they were never going to go anywhere, they're never going to get put down. They were never going to lose their power and their position. They were never going to lose their market share, their customers. Their share. Yeah, exactly. And then they did. Um, and then they did. And that's yeah. happened over and over and over. And so the term paper argument would be maybe we're at the end of this evolution of our current gigantic uh, right. computing, emailing, internetting, web services scene <laughs> companies. <laughs> right. And maybe there's a new thing coming on and probably related to AI. And we don't even know what that thing is called, maybe. So they've been around a while. Which, which makes me think maybe we should be talking about that next time, like in terms of big. So I guess I, just to wrap up on the big side of things, I think it's something we have to look at. I haven't really made it uh, a major issue, but I think it should be a major issue. Do you want the business that you're investing in to become big, global? Or do you start to see that there's a place beyond which they start to become the evil that we don't want to see in the world? I also so, think there's a good argument that actually this question really lines up with, with our investing style. So we can talk more about that. I'll make a note so that I remember to say my brilliant comment. All right, Next good. Time. Make a note. Also, let's talk a little bit about AI. I think some really interesting stuff. Oh, oh wow. There's no signal. some feedback. I think I might have to go. <laughs> oh, that was a voice. I thought it was feedback from the microphone. No, that's my dog. That's Red Butler. Okay. All right. He's saying stop. He's saying no. Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. I yep. guess that's the end. Until next time. See you. Hi, guys. Thanks for listening to Invested. If you enjoyed this episode and you want more information or to listen to additional episodes, visit our website at investedpodcast.com and sign up for my virtual workshop right there. Spots are definitely limited for this event. I'm not kidding. They really are. They sell out very quickly. So everything discussed on this podcast, by the way, is either my opinion or it's Danielle's opinion. And I'm really important. It's not to be taken as investing advice because I am not your financial advisor nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. So remember that. You're on your own here. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only, and I really hope you enjoyed it.